In this video, I will discuss a few select cardiac dysrhythmias. Abnormal cardiac rhythms are referred to as dysrhythmias, and prompt assessment of dysrhythmias and the patient's response to that dysrhythmia are critical for your patient's survival. First, we have normal sinus rhythm, and this is a person who has a regular rhythm with a heart rate of 60 to 100. Sinus bradycardia, the person will have a regular rhythm, but the heart rate will be less than 60. For some people, this will be normal. You might see this normal in athletes. And a lot of times while we're sleeping, we go into a sinus bradycardia. Other times where it may be of concern can be if the patient is having uh, carotid massage, doing the valve salvas maneuver, or um, administration of medications such as beta blockers or ACE inhibitors can also cause this. We would expect to see signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output, or I guess we should say we'd be watching for that, um, which could include pale, cool skin, hypotension, weakness, chest pain, dizziness, syncope, confusion, uh, shortness of breath. Treatment for bradycardia, if it was an emergent situation, could include atropine. Uh, if it's more of a chronic situation, the patient might be uh, considered for a pacemaker. And you may consider adjusting or holding some of their current medications if you determine that that is the cause. Sinus tachycardia, the person has um, a regular rhythm, but a heart rate greater than 100. Again, this might be considered normal while someone is exercising. You would anticipate if you're running on a treadmill that your heart rate would increase. But other times where uh, it can be a negative side effect would include fever, pain, hypotension, hypovolemia, anemia, hypoxia. It can also be caused by medications such as atropine, epinephrine, Sudafed. We would be watching for signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output. We would attempt to treat the cause if we know that. We might try some vasovagal maneuvers. Medications uh, may be given as well, such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. If we have someone who is in an atrial flutter, we might see these sawtooth flutter valves. And so you can see those there. That is indicating the atrial rate, which with atrial flutter will be between 200 to 350. And our ventricular rate, which is represented by our QRS, will be approximately 150. Atrial flutter can ca be caused by uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, valve disorders, if you're watching for signs and symptoms of cardiac, decreased cardiac output. Complications that can occur can include heart, uh, precipitating a heart failure exacerbation or thrombi formation. So when we think about atrial flutter and both atrial fibrillation, if the atria is not ejecting blood out of the atrium uh, appropriately and blood is pooling in the atrium, clots can form. And if clots are forming there, when they leave the atrium, they then move and can potentially cause a stroke or a pulmonary embolism. So treatment for atrial flutter would include beta blockers and other dysrhythmias. Catheter ablation would be the treatment of choice. You might do cardioversion if the patient is hemodynamically stable. If they're unable to convert the patient from an atrial flutter into a sinus rhythm, the patient should be considered to be put on long-term anticoagulant therapy such as Coumadin. And this will prevent or help prevent them from um, having that thrombi form formation, which can cause a CVA or a pulmonary embolism. For atrial fibrillation, now our atrium is fibrillating, so it's basically quivering. So we can see this here. And that atrial rate there, 350 to 600. Our ventricular rate, so our QRS, can be controlled. So if it's less than 100 beats per minute, we would call that a controlled atrial fibrillation. Anything greater than 100 would be an uncontrolled um, atrial fibrillation. This is considered the most common dysrhythmia, and it does increase uh, with age. It can uh, most often occur with patients who have coronary artery disease, hypertension, and heart failure. And it will be the most common dysrhythmia for patients with heart failure because if you think about what's happening in heart failure, the atrium are being expanded. They're being stretched over capacity due to the large amount of fluid overload that the person is experiencing. 
When that happens, the atrium can no longer function as they did previously, and they begin to do that quivering. And so you'll see atrial fibrillation very common in your heart failure population. You can see signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output. They have the same complication with the risk for thrombi formation. Treatment can include calcium channel blocker, blockers, beta blockers. Cardioversion is the treatment of choice, followed by catheter ablation or the maze procedure. And this person, if they are not unable to convert them to a sinus rhythm, would also need long-term Coumadin or another anticoagulant therapy. Premature ventricular contractions are wide distorted QRSs, I like this here. The rate can be regular or irregular, um, and they are classified as ventricular, bigeminy, trigeminy, or couplet. Typically, they occur with stimulants such as uh, coffee or caffeine, alcohol, nicotine. You can also see it uh, as a side effect of digoxin. It can happen if a patient is having fever, hypoxia, can be exercise or emotionally stress-induced can be occurring while the patient is having an MI, heart failure exacerbation, or if there are electrolyte imbalances, specifically our potassium and our magnesium. Patients can have these and have absolutely no signs and symptoms at all. Other times they can have re signs and symptoms of reduced cardiac output. The complication that we're most concerned about would be ventricular tachycardia. So treatment would be to treat the cause if we know, for example, if it's caffeine, we're gonna to wanna to decrease the caffeine. Um, and we can also see patients being started on beta blockers. If they have uh, PVCs that turn into sustained PVCs, we then refer to that as ventricular tachycardia. So here now we have the ventricular rate very fast. So you can see this here, a rate of 150 to 250. It can be regular or irregular. If the ventricular tachycardia continues, and usually we're saying if um, they're more than uh, 10 beats in a row, we have sustained VTAC. If a person goes into it um, just for a few beats or goes in and then comes out, we have non-sustained VTAC. The thing that we need to remember that's most important is that this can be lethal. So ventricular tachycardia can occur with MI, coronary artery disease, and like we said, electrolyte imbalances, specifically K and MAG, are very high contributors to ventricular tachycardia. The person will have signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output, and those will come on very quickly um, because a person will go into ventricular tachycardia and they are not going to have any cardiac output. The complications we're concerned about is the person then going into ventricular fibrillation and death. Uh, we're gonna try to treat the cause if we can, um, you might see medications such as beta blockers, antidysrhythmics, we're supplementing the K and MAG, um, but we would also anticipate that this person is going to need advanced cardiac life support um, and we're going to uh, be defibrillating this person, calling a code and defibrillating. Uh, with V-fib, the ventricle is quivering and there is absolutely no contraction and absolutely no cardiac output. They have no heart rate, there is no pulse. So again, when we have VTAC, we're very worried about a person going into V-fib. Uh, V-fib can occur um, during an MI from a heart failure exacerbation um, with VTAC or from hyperkalemia. The patient is going to be unresponsive, pulseless, and not breathing. And our complication um, is death. And so it is extremely important that we begin immediate CPR uh, advanced cardiac life support, so we're calling for a code, and defibrillation. The sooner we can start, start those things, the more likely this patient is to survive. And so we have something which is called um, sudden cardiac death, and that's death from a cardiac cause. And the majority of reasons patients have sudden cardiac death is it is resulting from a ventricular dysrhythmia. So ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, and V-fib is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. Systole, we have complete absence of any ventricular activity at all. So the person is not in V-fib, they're not in VTAC, there's no contraction at all, there's no electrical impulse, um, the patient does not have a pulse, there's no rhythm on the telemetry strip.
or your EKG strip. So, you know, this can happen for a variety of reasons. It can be cardiac disease, um, can be prolonged um, periods of V-fib, um, prolonged periods of um, hypoxia. So there's lots of different things that can cause a systole. But basically, you're going to find a patient who is unresponsive, pulseless, and not breathing. So, of course, we are worried about our complication of death. So, again, this is another person who needs um, immediate CPR, advanced cardiac life support, most likely intubation. So, our priority intervention here would be to be calling and initiating a code. We also have one other um, cardiac dysrhythmia that we're concerned about, and that is called pulseless electrical activity, or PEA. And for this, there's no organized electrical activity seen on the ECG. So we're not seeing any type of rhythm, and there's no pulse. Common cause is that this can happen right after defibrillation. It can happen from hypoxia, hypovolemia, drug overdose, um, hyper or hypokalemia, metabolic acidosis. So again, our primary treatment for this person is going to be to call that code. We want to get CPR started as soon as possible. Uh, we may be giving epinephrine. The patient will be intubated and we will be treating the cause. So that concludes uh, just some brief information about dysrhythmias for you. Thank you.